Hello, everybody. Welcome into another episode of the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I am Ryan Warmly, joined today by Andrew Erickson and Pat Fitzmorris. And fellas, we are looking ahead to the 2024 draft season for fantasy. We've, of course, done a lot of free agency stuff the last couple of weeks, some draft stuff, some dynasty stuff. Let's actually look ahead and kind of project what we'll be thinking about in August. We're going to predict out the top 36 rounds. Really what we're doing is we're looking at current ADP. You can find that ADP consensus on the Fantasy Pros website. We're going to be looking at that ADP information and kind of going through and saying, are these names right? Are they in the right order? Are the right guys kind of in the right tiers? We'll be hitting them in groups of six. So it's not kind of six tiers total. I uh, just want to let everybody know all of our early 2024 consensus rankings and tiers can be found at fantasypros.com slash rankings. You can also from there navigate to our Fantasy Pros staff. Specifically, what Fitz is thinking or what Erickson is thinking. Fitz, what do you think? Sounds like it's going to be a good show. It does, although you said uh, we're going to go through the top 36 rounds and not players. Oh. So I guess we're going to be talking about Mac Hollins, Braxton Berrios. Um, can't wait to break those guys down for sure. I didn't even catch that I had uh, said that. Yes, let me, let's me let put everybody's <laughs> minds at ease for who's worried about how we possibly fit 36 rounds into less than an hour. Uh, it is 36 picks, not rounds. Erickson, you ready to jump in? Yeah, now I'm ready to talk about the top three rounds. You know, I think that we spend a lot of time during draft season talking about like the top guys, even though we find that a lot of the league winners are the players that you draft really late and then deliver. Um, so I, I'm interested, though, to talk about the start of the drafts. This is half PPR ADP, just to be clear for everyone. Um, we will jump right in, right at the top of round one. The first six names, not going to be any surprises here, I wouldn't think, for anybody. Uh, Christian McCaffrey at one, C.D. Lamb at two, Justin Jefferson at three, Tyree Kill at four, Jamar Chase at five, and Brees Hall at six. It starts with a running back, it ends with a running back, and then the rest is wide receivers. Fitz, what was your initial takeaway to this top six? I think the top four wide receivers can be ordered in a variety of different ways. And Erickson and I have a lot of um, differences as to how we've ordered them. But like, I can't really, I can't really beef about any of those, except maybe, I don't know. Um, Erickson, I think has Justin Jefferson, number two. I get it. Justin Jefferson is great. And I think no matter who the quarterback is, even if it's a rookie and it's probably will be I think he'll fare well enough but I do wonder if he's got like the wide receiver one upside considering that he's going to be playing with an inexperienced quarterback and is going to be sharing targets with Jordan Addison and at some point TJ Hawkinson what's your order on the receivers Erickson so I have Chase Jefferson Lamb and then Hill so I have the same top four guys just in a slightly different order and is are they all after McCaffrey for you? No, I have Chase Jefferson and actually Brees Hall over McCaffrey. Fitz, what do you think about that? I mean, to me, it feels like McCaffrey will be the number one pick in in pretty much every draft, right? I think so, and I have him number one. I mean, I, the only argument I'm not going to buy for not having McCaffrey number one is that no one ever repeats. Like, I don't want to hear that as the argument because you know people were saying. Uh, Oh, no, uh, Scotty Scheffler's not going to win the Players' Championship again because no one's ever repeated, and Scotty Scheffler's on fire, and he won it back-to-back. -back. So, like, it, if you're good enough, you can repeat, you know, if, if, of course, health cooperates, and maybe that's the case that Erickson has against McCaffrey. Erickson, is that is it just the nature of the running back position, and he said something of an injury history in the past, or are you just really high on the receivers? I think part of it is I am really high on specifically on Jamar Chase. I think that I was just a year too early on Jamar Chase last year with the injuries to Joe Burrow. I think that Chase could go new. I, th I still think T. Higgins is going to get traded, uh, even though the splits with Chase with Higgins don't necessarily really matter. If Chase if, or if Higgins is gone, that can solidify more of the touchdowns, more of the targets, more of the receptions, the yards for Jamar Chase to just go absolutely nuclear. I think that Chase, I like a lot more than CeeDee Lamb. I feel like CeeDee Lamb is like, we're just looking exactly what he did last year and like kind of just copy and pasting what he did last year when last year was his like actual first breakout year where he was like an ultra elite wide receiver where he'd kind of been on the fringe of a fantasy wide receiver one. But back to the initial question with McCaffrey, it doesn't really have to do with him necessarily as a player that could get hurt or get injured, but I'm looking at it from the 49ers offense as a whole. 49ers with healthiest off on offense in the NFL last year. Number one, those things tend to regress year over year. 
the things regress to the mean. And the 49ers traditionally have been one of the teams that gets injured more often than not. <laughs> so that's something that I'm looking at, whereas if no one is going to pay attention to that at all, because like you said, he's the consensus one-on-one every single draft. But if no one's going to look at it and be like, okay, well, this team stayed really healthy last year. If we had to be- put our chips in on a player that could get hurt on the team that was healthiest last year, that would not be as lucky in terms of health, who would we bet on that player be? Probably Christian McCaffrey. So for me, yeah, I am a little bearish on CMC staying healthy for all the games, especially because he's also coming off a season where he led the NFL in touches. Who was that guy two years ago? Josh Jacobs. How did he do? Not great. Like the track record of not just McCaffrey himself coming off injuries, but any running back coming off a season where they led the NFL in touches, it's it's really bad. So if everyone else is just going to ignore that completely, I'll try to take advantage of it. It does feel fits that Lamb is is... I, maybe this is wrong to say. It kind of feels like he's the highest floor. Like you, you make you can make the case against Jefferson. Like rookie quarterbacks do often, even when they have good seasons, they do often struggle to support you know elite wide receivers right off the bat. Tyree Kill getting older, really reliant on his speed. Jamar Chase, obviously, there's been injury stuff with Burrow. You don't know what's going to happen with T. Higgins. Lamb is like he will clearly be the number one. We know who his quarterback is. We know what the offense is going to look like. Does that give him a higher floor maybe than the other three guys? I think so. We know the Cowboys are pretty unlikely to add significant target competition. But um, to Erickson's earlier point about Lamb's breakout season coming last year, I mean, I think there's a good reason for that. Um, The Cowboys had a much stronger running game earlier in in Lamb's career, and they lost uh, that last year. No Ezekiel Elliott. Tony Pollard was not what people were hoping he would be. And really now Pollard's gone. Um, unless you think Rico Dowdle is going to turn into the new Tony Dorsett for the Cowboys, they're going to be drafting a backfield for the most part. So it it seems like they will be pass heavy again, most likely. And yeah, with, with Lamb clearly the alpha target in this offense, I think things are looking pretty rosy for him again. With, with that rationale, Pat, you know, you just kind of like laid out how the, the path for CD Lamb to be the wide receiver one. Isn't that what Jamar Chase is looking at? Like they just got rid of their running back. They're potentially shipping off T. Higgins. So wouldn't it make... I mean, I have Chase over Lamb. I don't know if you have Chase over Lamb. But wouldn't that mean, hey, if we're rejecting forward, Chase can have the Lamb season from last year, this year? Yeah, so I have Lamb one spot ahead of Chase. But like, I I don't have a major beef with flip-flopping those two guys. I do have Chase ahead of Jefferson. We're not going to dive deep on every player in every round, but I do think it's really interesting here at the top. So I just want to get your guys' opinion. Are you concerned about Tyree Kill at all, just given the age and and the fact that, uh, you know, he, he just the Miami offense as a whole was not able to sustain what they started last season as into, you know, November and December as well. And again, just getting older, so reliant on speed that when that goes, what is that going to do to his his output? I mean, Fitz, where, where do you stand on hill right now compared to these other elite options do you do you think the speed is going to go that all of a sudden he's going to turn into uh alan lazard or something like no i I don't think it's going to be gone entirely but it's just when you're so reliant on it and getting older and getting more banged up you know it worries me nfl players all the time we see ken fall off a cliff i don't think that's going to happen but it would be in the back of my mind i think at least yeah i like i think Hill is at the absolute height of his powers. He's my wide receiver one, um, even though he doesn't have a, a tip-top elite quarterback. I mean, Tua, I, I think, is still, well, Tua's not going to run. Like, he's got to do his business through the air. Um, Hill has managed to produce elite numbers despite sharing the field with another 1,000-yard receiver in Jalen Waddell. And I mean, Hill has been pretty indestructible so far, um, including there was a game last year where it he sustained what looked like a pretty bad ankle injury, high ankle type thing. Bounced right back, was in like two plays later and, uh, you know, yeah. producing. So, like, I have no concerns about Tyreek Hill. Like, I, I do think he is the most dangerous weapon there is in the NFL wide receiver. Erickson, the, the last guy, obviously, that we haven't really mentioned since I listed out these top six is Brees Hall. Where do you think he fits in these rankings? And obviously, we're anticipating a full season for Aaron Rodgers. But uh, I mean, his season, you know, injured the first year, had the quarterback problems the second year. You know, the upside is is clear. We know the talent and the pedigree, um, but he's he's ranked pretty aggressively here. I think he should be RB1. That's where I have him ranked. 
And my argument for you guys, and we'll do a little thought experiment for those listening as well. Who are we drafting first overall in 2025? Christian McCaffrey or Brees Hall? Who do you think is going to be at the top of the board? I think it's more likely to be Brees Hall. And, and, and if that's the case, right? It, you know, McCaffrey's going to be almost 30, 29 years old. Brees Hall will be 24, I believe. If that's the case, and we're looking ahead to next year, when it's like 2025 drafts, who's the RB1? Who's the 101? If that's Brees Hall, then what has to happen this year for that to happen? Like, I think Brees Hall's set up to smash. And it's for all the reasons, like, that I'm kind of fading McCaffrey, in a sense, where the Jets were the most injured team last year. They had no injury luck. And all they're doing this year is going all in, upgrading the offensive line across the board. They're getting Rodgers back. Like, Brees Hall was the top 10 running back last year when he had nothing around him. It was horrible. And he's coming off the ACL injury. Like, I want to get the rising tide, which I think is Brees Hall. And that's why he's my RB1. So, and with McCaffrey, look, is it going to be as good as it was last year? I mean, last year was a really special year for him. Like, I don't know if it's it's tough for him to repeat that. So, for me... Yeah, I love Brees Hall. I love how I can get him as the sixth guy off the board. Fitz, it looks like in your rankings on the site, you have Hall sixth. Do you think he's, you know, kind of clearly behind the top five? Are you happy with him at six? Is he kind of a placeholder because there's a clear top five? How are you ranking him? Yeah, I should probably think more about this. And like, I'm good with him at six because I, I love those top four wide receivers and think they're all just superstars and deserve to be in the top six. But, um, you know, with the running back shortage that there is, the the lack of just elite top level producers at the position, maybe Hall should go ahead of some of those wide receivers, if if not all of them. I, I get it. Like sticking your neck out for Brees Hall, I, I buy it. I, I can understand um wanting to lock down that sort of production at the running back position. Cause if he is healthy, he is gonna produce. There's no question about it. Um so I I really have no qualms with what Erickson is trying to sell here. The thrill and excitement of March Mania is here, and DraftKings Sportsbook, one of America's top-rated sportsbook apps, is giving new customers a shot to turn 5 bucks into $150 instantly in bonus bets with any college basketball bet. We are now through the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. It was a blast, as always. On to the Sweet 16 now. It is chock full of incredible teams and enticing matchups. I am most intrigued by Iowa State, Illinois going head-to-head, number one defense on Ken Palm, going up against the number one offense on Ken Palm. That spread is just two points. It's going to be really fascinating to see the, uh, you know, immovable, you know, unstoppable force against the immovable object. Uh, I'm also intrigued by Alabama UNC considering the pace both those teams play at. That total is at an insane 173 and a half, and yet even that might be too low. However you plan to bet the Sweet 16 and beyond, download the DraftKings Sportsbook app and use code FANTASYPROS. New customers can bet 5 bucks to get $150 instantly in bonus bets only at DraftKings Sportsbook with code fantasy pros the crown is yours let's go to the next group here rounding out round one at number seven amon ross st brown at number eight Bijan robinson at number nine aj brown at number 10 puka nakua at number 11 garrett wilson and at number 12 Jameer Gibbs. Erickson, I want to start with you because when you were sort of posing the question with Brees Hall, you know, in your mind's eye, 2025, who is going to be, has a chance of being the number one overall pick? Uh, my mind went to both B. John Robinson and Jameer Gibbs as options. So I can totally see why they're being drafted in round one. You know, Bijan in particular with, you know, a, a better run offense around him. Clearly the quarterback upgrade should lead to more scoring opportunities. We know the talent he has, but Jameer Gibbs can make a lot of those same cases as well. What do you think about those two running backs and where they're ranked? I, I love the prices for both of them. Bijan's actually going one spot later than last year. And that's despite the fact that, you know, you can look at Kirk Cousins. I know that I'm not as high on the Kirk Cousins landing spot to Atlanta as some other people, but I, it's still an upgrade, like no matter what way you shape it. And the fact that Bijan is just a little bit cheaper than last year when everything should be better, especially when it comes to him not necessarily splitting nearly as much red zone work with Tyler Algier. Like, I mean, how can you not be excited about Bijan? Like, you know, when I was looking at my running back rankings, like I could put Bijan ahead of Chris McCaffrey too. Like, I, again, like I'm not the highest on McCaffrey entering this season. And uh, yeah, Brees Hall, Bijan, like I could go back and forth with those two in particular. And Gibbs is just a bet on that uber efficiency. And really the cap with him is just, is it just because Dave Montgomery is too involved? Where Gibbs is still really productive, but for him, I think to crack like top three, he probably has to just take on a much larger share of the workload. Now, again, you do benefit from him being healthier all year long because he's not necessarily taking as much toll on his body. 
But obviously we know in fantasy, it's like volume is king. Like, and Gibbs is not going to get anywhere near 300 touches. Probably shouldn't. As long as Dave Montgomery, who again is just a very productive running back in his own right. So again, I do get the gap between Bijan and Gibbs to an extent, but I, I don't really care about the touches. Like Gibbs was so good last year. So electric plays in a really good offense. So yeah, I think that even at the back end of round one, I think that that's a justified pick. What do you think fits Bijan's ADP? Like I said, is eight Gibbs at 12. Is this the right range for these guys to be going back into the first round? I think so. Wouldn't shock me if Bijan outscored Brees Hall this year. Like I think they're in the same, um, same range as far as just pure talent. And Jameer Gibbs, Erickson summed it up pretty well. Yes, David Montgomery is there, but Gibbs was very efficient last year. And early in the season, Gibbs did not produce the way we were hoping him to uh, hoping for him to produce with Montgomery around. Montgomery gets hurt. Gibbs becomes immensely valuable. But then once Monty got back, Gibbs was still quite valuable. Um, and I, I think that's kind of the dynamic we'll see going forward with Gibbs, you know, not having his value completely kneecapped by the presence of Montgomery. So then, Fitz, what about these receivers? Is this the right group of four guys? Again, Amon Ra, Puka, A.J. Brown, Garrett Wilson. Is, is Are these the right four names to be going in the back end of the first round, or would you have anybody else in there? No, that's it. I mean, I, I pretty much agree with that, and I think there's a drop-off after these three guys. Erickson, what do you think? No, I, I agree. I, I think that, you know, when I was kind of looking at some of my wide receiver rankings heading into next year, looking at how you can kind of tier these guys. And I think this is kind of where we hit the end of that. This guy's going to be an elite producer. Like you should be trying to get these guys in round one or the beginning of round two, because then after that, we start to see the wide receiver scoring start to flatten. And it's really more about values, the name of the game. So if you miss out on this tier, these of the round one wide receivers, essentially, then you don't necessarily need to draft the next highest ranked wide receiver as we're going to get into, because that next highest ranked guy, he's probably not that different from the guy that you get the, at the end of round two or at the beginning of round three. And you start to see the scoring kind of flatten out at wide receiver where we know the scoring is kind of flatter. So I, I agree with A.J. Brown, Amon Ross St. Brown, Puka as that next tier behind uh, the guys in the first half of the first round. One more time through the whole first round. Christian McCaffrey, C.D. Lamb, Justin Jefferson, Tyree Kill, Jamar Chase, Brees Hall, Amon Ross St. Brown, B. John Robinson, A.J. Brown, Puka Nakua, Garrett Wilson, and Jameer Gibbs. Any other thoughts on the first round? Any area that you think you know have a major disagreement with, Fitz, or is this, is this pretty much right? I think it's pretty much right. Um, any differences that I have with that list are pretty minor. Um, I, I think it's not till the second round where the chaos begins. Same thoughts, Erickson? I guess for me, I guess I kind of want to pose the question. I don't know what, what it is with Garrett Wilson, but I'm having like trouble, like just like wiping away all of last year. And it seems like that's what drafters are pretty much basically doing, right? Like they're not holding anything against what happened last year with Kameen Wilson and produced last year because the quarterback play was horrible. But do you think that it's too aggressive to just kind of put him back where he was at the beginning of last year with all the high expectations of Aaron Rodgers coming in? It's like, all right, well, just throw out last year erase it basically you're doing that thing from men in black where you just forget you forget about the jet season you forget about it entirely and you put garrett wilson right back where he should be or he was last year do you think that's accurate i mean that's kind of where i have him ranked anyway so like i'm kind of doing it but it's like should we just be automatically putting him in that spot I think if you're ranking him in, you know, at all towards the top, it's based on the understanding that you think Aaron Rodgers will be back and healthy. Because if he's not, then you wouldn't be ranking him, you know, in the top 24, maybe. I, I don't know. I guess it depends on who the other quarterback is that they would have. But I think if you're ranking him aggressively in the slightest, it's because you think Aaron Rodgers is going to be healthy. And if you think Aaron Rodgers is going to be healthy, then I think he deserves a very high ranking. I mean, that would be how I would approach it. It's, it's basically just a bet on if Rodgers is going to be Rodgers or not. I mean, what do you think, Fitz? We didn't see anything last year to really make us doubt that Garrett Wilson was the supremely talented guy we uh, first saw when he entered the league. So I, I think it's right to have him there. And Erickson and I both have him 14th overall, so we're not quite on board with the Garrett Wilson as a first-rounder sentiment, but um, we're pretty close to it. And I think there's a big drop-off after the top 16 or so. And, like, I... It, for my overall rankings, I was kind of struggling trying to figure out 
how to put guys in that 17 to 25 range because I just don't think there are a lot of guys worthy of it. And I think Garrett Wilson is clearly like a cut above those guys in terms of desirability. Just a reminder that our mock draft simulator tool is now open at fantasypros.com slash simulator. It's a fast and free way to practice for any kind of draft, including dynasty startup drafts and rookie drafts. Again, that's at fantasypros.com slash simulator. Let's move on to round two here, guys. At number 13, Kyron Williams. At number 14, Jonathan Taylor. Number 15, Josh Allen, a quarterback, going very early. Number 16, DJ Moore. Number 17, Devontae Adams. And number 18, Devon Achan. Fitz, I'll start with you. What was your big takeaway from this grouping? No, oh, man, Josh Allen just doesn't belong this high. And yes, he was the QB1 last year, and he's going to be my QB1 this year, but top 15. Come on. Josh Allen had 15 rushing touchdowns last year. And I think the previous two years he had what, 13 combined? So that that number is going to come down. Um, really good, but just does not deserve to go this high. I think Erickson and I and I both believe Jonathan Taylor is a round one value. I mean, the the Jonathan Taylor, Anthony Richardson. Uh, combination is just going to be magic, and I, I can't wait to see it. It's it's really nice that we're going to get a quiet Jonathan Taylor summer after all the uh, just upheaval there was with that guy last year. And then he comes back, and he is the RB8 in fantasy points per game, despite the fact that Zach Moss basically out- out-touched him 2-1 to one in his first two games back as the Colts worked him in really slowly. So, um it, I don't know. Taylor's still the guy who had 1,800 rushing yards and 18 touchdowns in his second NFL season. And that was without Anthony Richardson, who's just going to spike his efficiency because of the rushing threat that he poses. So, man, I, I wholeheartedly believe Jonathan Taylor should be a first rounder. Erickson, I think you have him ranked similarly. Yep, I have him RB10. So I actually have Jonathan Taylor ahead of Jameer Gibbs. Well, you have him 10th overall, not yeah. RB10. Right? Yeah, yeah, 10th overall, yep. So actually, yeah, again, I have him ahead of Gibbs because I just think, like, who who is he splitting carries with? They got rid of Zach Moss. Like, like it, what's his name? The guy, Trey Sermon? <laughs> is that the guy we're afraid? Like, uh, they're not going to use him. So the concern is, oh, well, Richardson gets all the rushing touchdowns because it's so easy for us here in March to just project how every team is going to score each and every single one of their touchdowns. It's hard to do. So... I mean, you want to bet on the efficiency, right? If Jonathan Taylor's going to be averaging six yards per carry and touches the ball 300 times, odds are the guy's probably going to score fantasy points one way or the other. So, yeah, I I think that Taylor should be a a round one guy. And for me, the guy that I'm concerned about, I agree with Josh Allen kind of being too high here at 15. Uh, DJ Moore. When is the right time to take the first quarterback? Sorry to interrupt you, but before we move on from Allen, because I think that's this is really, really interesting question every year is you, the elite guys are becoming more elite. Like Allen has been a top two quarterback four straight years in fantasy. Like, you know, you're getting elite production, but there's still so much talent on the board. So Erickson, when is the right time to take whoever QB one is? I just want to take the guy that can get the cheapest. So it's like, yeah, you talk about how good Josh Allen was. Well, what if I got Lamar Jackson two rounds later? It's like, that's what I would rather do. So I, I, you got to tier the quarterbacks in the way that you view them as like the elite guys and you draft the guy that gets picked last. Like that's the way I see it. And and I think that's going to lead me like last year that would have led you away from Mahomes because he was going ahead of a lot of the other elite quarterbacks just because of the name brand. But now this year, because of how bad Mahomes was last year, he goes at the end of that tier. So now it's like, I want to draft Mahomes. If I'm going to take an elite quarterback, I want to get the one at the best price. So that's the way I approach it. And that's usually not until round four really is really where I'm looking the earliest I would take a, an elite quarterback. Okay. I'm sorry. I did interrupt you. So I, I'm actually really curious to hear who you were going to say as the guy that worries you, because I think you're actually significantly lower than fits on a handful of guys in this grouping. Yeah. Now that I actually like kind of look at it again, like I'm kind of, I'm kind of worried about a lot of these guys in this, <laughs> in this particular uh, tier. Um, but I'll just go with, uh, to start with, with DJ Moore, um, brand new quarterback, uh, Keenan Allen's coming in. I, I don't think Keenan Allen is going to just disappear. Like the guy wakes up and, and catches 150 targets. Like that's all he's done. That's all he does is just vacuum up targets, especially at the intermediate level. So DJ Moore, as great as he was last year, one of the things that you have to look at when it comes to wide receivers underperforming the following year is fantasy points scored over expectation. DJ Moore was top of the list last year in terms of fantasy points scored over expectation. And 
what are you taking away? You're taking about the quarterback. Look, you can say what you want about Fields, but DJ Moore was really good with Justin Fields last year. Like that that was real. And then when they took away Justin Fields when he was hurt, again it was a rookie quarterback, it was a guy who was undrafted, but DJ Moore's production tanked. So not necessarily not necessarily saying that his production is going to tank as bad as it was when Tyson Badgett was under center last year, but to say that he's going to be as productive as he was when Justin Fields was at his peak with a rookie quarterback and as the number one overall pick to be worthy of a second round selection, I think that's way too much confidence in DJ Moore to take him in the second round. Fitz, what do you make of Moore? And you know, Erickson mentioned Keenan Allen. I still think it's very possible they target Roma Dunze or somebody like that at with the ninth pick in the draft if he gets there because Allen is aging and I don't think he's under contract for more than a, another year. Like I think that's still on the table too, which is just another you know really talented mouth to feed in the offense. So 16th overall is way too high for DJ Moore. I've got him 23rd overall, and this kind of gets to what I was talking about earlier with the big drop-off after number 16, and DJ Moore is in that group of guys I'm I'm not feeling great about ranking between 17th and 25th overall. So I do think a lot of Erickson's points about the DJ Moore situation are valid. Um, I do think he's a terrific player. And I do think that even though maybe his piece of the pie gets a little smaller in this passing game, maybe the overall pie gets a little bigger because Justin Fields never averaged 200 passing yards a game for the Bears. Uh, Luke Getze's gone. So I think this offense is going to look a lot different next year with Caleb Williams um, as the, the trigger man. So I'm optimistic that they're going to average more than 200 passing yards a game. I have to ask you guys about A-Chan because our staff rankings on him are so wildly disparate. It's uh, Debra has him 12th, Erickson has him 40th, Fitz has him 16th, and Joe has him 40th. So, Erickson, I don't know how you feel about being on the same side of history as Joey P, but you and he are definitely way lower on A-Chan than uh, Fitz and Debra are. So what are you not seeing with A-Chan here? I mean, is he going to see starting work? Is he going to play the full season? Like... How's that Dolphins offensive line looking? Like, there's a lot of red flags with his profile. Like, he didn't even play the whole year. Yes, I get he was really explosive when he got the opportunities to play, but a lot of it came against the early in the season when Miami was steamrolling teams. Like, they did all year. When they played a bad team, they destroyed them. When they played good teams, they weren't as lucky. So, again, is he the starting running back on his own team? If you look at every single Miami Dolphins depth chart, which I had to do today, Raheem Mostert is RB1. Not Devon Achan. Now, I get he's getting Mostert's going to get hurt. I get that. Like, I thought that was going to happen last year. (laughs) It never happened. He's stayed healthy the entire season. So, yes, I still have A-Chan ahead of Raheem Mostert in my rankings. But comes to week one, who's going to get the first carry for the Dolphins? It's probably going to be Mostert. Like, how long are we going to wait for A-Chan to take over the backfield when that may not ever be what the Miami Dolphins want to have happen? Like, when A-Chan came back in the second half of the season, why was he never unleashed? Like, why did they never give him more carries? Why? Because he's not a guy that's supposed to take on that type of workload. So, again... Gibbs showed last year that he could consistently put up production in a split backfield. That was not the case with A-Chan, in my opinion. So that's where I see the difference between the players, and that's why I have A-Chan significantly lower than my counterparts. Fitz, what do you think about that? I mean, does does A-Chan need a full workload in this offense with his skill set? That's exactly it, Worm, because he is the same sort of electric talent that Jameer Gibbs is. And um, yes, we did not really see the A-chain usage stabilized in any sort of way last year. And that's what makes him a tough guy to rank this year, just because we don't know what um, the ideal Devon A-chain usage looks like because it was all over the place last year. But even if Mostert does somehow stay relatively healthy for an entire season, like A-chain is going to get, he's going to get like 10 touches a game on average minimum when he's healthy and he can do a lot of damage on 10 touches. If you need new tires for your car, Discount Tire is your go-to. They have exceptional service, and you get a 30% shorter average wait time when you buy and book online at DiscountTire.com. They have this really cool feature called Treadwell, which is an online tire buying guide that gives you transparency on tire performance, as well as personalized recommendations based on your location and driving habits. Discount Tire is also the largest independent tire retailer in the country, so it has the biggest selection of tires and wheels. And here's a pro tip from the experts at Discount Tire. 
tire, you can prevent wear and boost gas mileage by keeping your tires properly inflated. Tire pressure supports the weight of your vehicle and is important to check for safety. So if it's been over a month since you last checked your tire pressure, stop by one of their local stores for a free tire safety and air pressure check. Discount tire, let's get you taken care of. Let's move to the back half of round two. At 19th, it's Chris Olave. 20 is Nico Collins. 21 is Stefan Diggs. 22, Saquon Barkley. 23, Travis Etienne. And 24, Debo Samuel Erickson. What was your initial takeaway to this grouping of players? I think that Stefan Diggs and Debo Samuel are too high. I, I, I Look, Diggs was horrible last year. Debo Samuel was productive, but we know what his injury history is with the way that he plays. He's playing in a – he's also in a weird circumstance, too, where they're talking about trading Brandon Ayuk, but what if they trade Debo Samuel instead? Like, I feel safe about the running backs here. Like, I feel safe about Barkley and what his role is going to be in the offense, Travis Etienne. Like, I know Tank Bigsby's coming after me on Twitter now, but I'll still say, like, Travis Etienne is still the guy until he gets uh, deplanted from that spot. So that's the way I kind of look at it. I think some of these receivers are a little overvalued, especially on the older side, whereas like Olave, Nico Collins, it's like, okay, we're just chasing breakouts. For me, the guy that's not even talked about in this entire round is Brandon Ayuk, and I have him ranked all above all these wide receivers because I think Ayuk is going to be a wide receiver one when the dust settles on the NFL draft, whether he's the number one in San Francisco or he's the number one on a new team. And Ayuk has been super efficient, all throughout his NFL career, he just needs targets, and he's going to get them. I think this season. I think that's going to value. That's going to launch him over all these guys in this particular tier. So I think that Ayuk is uh, missing from this spot. Yeah, I tend to agree. I, I do like Olave and and Collins to a degree, but yeah, there's like zero percent chance I'm taking Stefan Diggs over Brandon Ayuk this season. It's just like not going to happen. And I I think as we get to August like ADP will start to reflect that. Fitz, what was your takeaway from this group of players? Same thing on Diggs. And just to uh, illustrate Erickson's point about Diggs last season, from week 10 on, um, including Buffalo's two playoff games, Diggs averaged 42.2 yards per game. Uh, That's not a small sample size. That's 10 games if you count those playoff games. Had one touchdown over that 10-game span and averaged 5.3 yards per target, which is just awful. So um, I'm like, I'm not touching Stefan Diggs in the first three rounds. I'm just not. I mean, Erickson and I both have him outside the top 36. So he would not be a, a top three rounder for either of us. Um, the guy I'm a little worried about here is Travis Etienne. Like, speaking of late season swoons, over his last nine games of 2023, Etienne averaged 47.2 rushing yards per game, 3.66 yards per carry. He had 57 or fewer rushing yards in all but one of those last nine games. So I'm I'm a little more concerned about him than other people seem to be since he's considered like, uh, I don't know, pretty solid second rounder. And I just I don't know if I can buy it. One player that you guys are both higher on than his ranking here is Saquon, who obviously changes teams, goes to the you know, he gets the offensive line upgrade in a better offense. Still don't know what we're going to see with the tush push without Jason Kelsey. It's, you know, a different type of offense. He might not get checked down to as much, but obviously the talent around him is a huge upgrade in Philly. And you guys are ranking him, you know, in that top 15 range rather than here in the, the early 20s. Erickson, what are your thoughts on Saquon? I just think that it's not... I just want to be copying and pasting like what DeAndre Swift did in this offense for Saquon. Like, I think it's going to be different. Like, why else would you sign a running back if you're going to run the exact same offense that you would just insert replaceable running back here with? So I don't think it's going to be like that. Tush- if that's the only thing against Saquon, like people are like, well, the Eagles are going to score a bunch of touchdowns, but Saquon's not going to score any of them. Like, DeAndre Swift was never the goal line back on any of his teams, like, for multiple stops of his NFL career. Like, they're always trying to find other ways to use a different goal line back than DeAndre Swift. Saquon Barkley is, is going to see holes open up in this in this backfield that he's only dreamt of having. He's not running behind the Giants' offensive line anymore. So I don't want to overthink this. It's like Saquon got a monster contract. He got a monster upgrade when it comes to the personnel that he's working around. He's not. He doesn't have to be Superman on every single play. Like he can just pick up the yardage. And I think he's going to score a bunch of touchdowns. So for me, I'm not. I'm not trying to overthink it. I know Barkley's a super talented guy. He's still young. He can catch passes. And that's probably actually the biggest concern is like how many passes he's going to catch because he's no longer the best receiver on his team. So you are going to need those touchdowns. But I think it's being overblown with the tush push. And it's like, 
maybe they just, what if they put Saquon on our center? And then we just, oh, we all faded Saquon, and then he scores 15 touchdowns. <laughs> like, oh, well, that was dumb. So I, I'll take my chances with Saquon in an upgraded uh, environment. Fitz, you've mentioned a couple of times that you see a very clear top 16 in the rankings and you've got Saquon at 15. So he's in that, you know, upper echelon for you. I do. And I've been a little concerned that Saquon hasn't really been explosive as a pass catcher since like 2019. Probably does not have 60 catch upside in this offense. And um, there is the question of how many goal line carries he loses to Jalen Hurts. But the offensive ecosystem is so much better than what he was uh what he had around him with the Giants last year. And Erickson mentioned that just the offensive line. Oh my gosh, going from the Giants to this. And I know <laughs> losing Jason Kelsey is no small thing, but they've still got Jordan Mailata, uh, Landon Dickerson, Lane Johnson. Like this is still a phenomenal offensive line. So he is going to find uh, things much more to his liking, I think, in Philadelphia than he did with the Giants last year. Let's move to round three at number 25 overall, Jalen Hurts. The next quarterback goes off the board at number 26, Brandon Ayuk. Number 27, Rashi Rice. Number 28, Sam Laporta, the first tight end. Number 29, Marvin Harrison Jr., first rookie. And number 30, Michael Pittman Jr. Fitz, we have talked on the Dynasty Show a lot about Marvin Harrison Jr., you know, he's considered, uh, you know, the, the latest in a line of generational prospects. You know, that word gets thrown out a lot, but that's how people have been talking about Harrison. Obviously, the son of the Hall of Famer, um, just an uber, uber, uber talented prospect. Everybody should go listen to the Dynasty show to hear us gush about him even more. Is the first half of round three the right spot to be drafting him in redraft leagues as a rookie? I think you could make a case for round two even. There's just no doubt in my mind that he is going to be an impactful NFL wide receiver from day one. And we've seen like over the last three years, if not further, um, wide receivers drafted in the first round, not named Quentin Johnston, have been ADP bargains. Um, we saw with Jamar Chase, Justin Jefferson, these guys like turning a big profit on their rookie year ADP. I think it's going to be the same with Marvin Harrison. And I'm not going to barbecue Erickson for just barely having Marvin in his top 60. I know different analysts handle the pre NFL draft ranking of rookies differently. Um, you know, but if uh, Erickson still has Harrison outside the top 50 come May, then, you know, then I'm then I'm going to fricassee him on one of these shows. <laughs> Erickson, what do you think about that? I just think that I just don't like the value on, on drafting him this high. So basically you're betting on, so like to comparison, like he's going right next to Rashi Rice, right? So Rashi Rice oh, yeah. is a rookie wide receiver that broke out as a rookie. So essentially you're drafting Marvin Harrison after basically locking and loading, like, okay, he broke out his rookie year, essentially. Like when you're matching him compared to a second year wide receiver. Fits hit on the rookie receivers being really profitable, like exceeding ADP. I would rather draft rookie wide receivers that have a less chance of hitting that have a better chance of making up the ground in ADP. So if Marvin Harrison comes out and finishes as a wide receiver 12 and I drafted him in the second round. What is, what is that? Or I drafted him in the third round. What did, did I win? Like, what do I win there? All I did was get a asset that delivered on his ADP. I didn't gain anything by drafting him here. Like I'm looking to gain steam, like where you drafted Rashi Rice last year. Like that was a major win because of how good he was versus how late he was going. That's all baked into the Marvin Harrison is already going to break out. He's going to finish inside the top 15 and you got to draft him there. So it's like, well, what am I gaining by drafting him this high? So I get why he's ranked that high and he'll probably finish in that range. But I'm looking for wins here. I'm looking for guys that can exceed their ADP and who does that better than anyone else? Rookie wide receivers. So I'll take Malik Neighbors two rounds later. Take Roman Dunze three rounds later. Like, that's how I would rather approach it. So for me, you know, if I don't get Marvin Harrison Jr. this year and he finishes as a you know, wide receiver 12, like, okay, well, he was good, but I got better value so with some of these other rookie wide receivers. Fitz, is there a landing spot that he could reasonably go to that would have you come off the Marvin Harrison hype a bit? You know, obviously Arizona is the most common one. Perhaps they trade down. L.A. obviously would be a great fit in terms of the opportunity, but, you know, the offense is not going to be wide receiver Giants. focused. You know, And I was going to say the Giants are then next, so it's it's kind of hard to imagine Harrison falling to six, but if he does and goes to New York, 
you know, that's a worse setup than it would be, you know, with Kyler Murray or, or Justin Herbert as his quarterback. So is there a spot where you think this would actually be a little too rich to draft him here? Oh, I'm coming down for sure if he lands on the Giants, New England, um, and maybe even the Chargers, just because I don't know how. Well, all of a sudden with the Chargers, the way their uh, pass catchers have been depleted now, even if they are run heavy, which I expect them to be with Greg Roman and Jim Harbaugh calling the shots. He's going to be the only show in town, basically, as far as pass catchers. Um, you know, Josh Palmer is the complimentary receiver, whatever. Um, he would have a massive target share, and I'd be high. The, the one thing I'd push back on Erickson about, like, I think Harrison has, like, top six upside at wide receiver. So I believe you actually can turn a profit with him in the third round. Um, and I, like, I rank him 17. He's he's below that ledge uh, after the top 16 for me, but my goodness, this guy has all sorts of upside. Like he is going to make a splash right away. And every one of these teams, he'll be the top option from day one. No you know, question. Certainly New England, Arizona. I know they have Trey McBride, but he's going to be the wide receiver one. Obviously LA and New York. I mean, he'll be, he'll be wide receiver one wherever he goes. Um, Looking at the rest of this kind of grouping, it's a lot of young players with talent. You know, Rasheed Rice, second-year player. Sam Laporta, obviously a stellar first season. Is he the right guy for tight end one? Travis Kelsey's coming up in the next round. Are we kind of officially passing the torch after last season, Fitz? I've got Laporta ranked one spot ahead of Kelsey in my overall rankings, not just a tight end. Laporta is my TE1, but Kelsey is right behind him. Like, I don't want to totally bury Kelsey. The reason that I had Kelsey sort of lower in my rankings, like right after the Super Bowl, was because I had some doubt about whether he was going to come back. I thought he might just call it quits after the championship, but no, um, no retirement announcement. So it looks like he will be back. And I don't know, um, maybe last year was the beginning of the end and, and the drop off gets a little more precipitous this year, but maybe not. I mean, he just missed a thousand yard season and everyone was talking about how disappointing Travis Kelsey was last year. So if that's disappointing, um, you know, sign me up for him as a, a mid to late third round pick. Eric said, it looks like you're far lower on Kelsey. Um, are you, we'll get to him a little bit more in the next section, but are you high on Laporta higher than Kelsey? I mean, I think that makes sense. Laporta is, is tight end one, but like, I just don't think that it's a, I mean, look, besides Travis Kelsey being like the first tight end drafted every single year, like drafting the first tight end hasn't traditionally worked. Like the best strategy was the best strategy is to draft like a Sam Laporta player, right? What it, you win in twofold, right? Because you win Sam Laporta scores so many points and because he was dirt cheap. Like, I just think that's a better approach to just the tight end position in general when you're drafting. Like you want to find value at the, I talked about it with quarterback, same thing with tight end. And that's the way I play like on these onesie positions. Like I want to find the value in them. So, I mean, would it surprise me at all if Trey McBride scores more points than Laporta? Even if they bring in Marvin Harrison Jr., like, no. Like, Trey McBride was a monster down the stretch. He was also a second-round pick. Like, very, like, great college profile. So, if I can get Trey McBride two rounds later, I'll just do that. Like, if I want to get an elite tight end. Like, what about Mark Andrews? Is he is he dead? Like, no. Like, he was really productive before he got hurt last year. And he's still the number one receiver on that team. So, I can get him cheaper. I can get Mark Andrews cheaper than he's, like, ever been. Because Zay Flowers is there? Like, is that really the reason why we're not going to draft Andrews? Is it because he's gotten hurt? He just got hurt last year. Like, He's it's his injury problem has been Lamar has been the guy that's been getting hurt, not him. So I, I think that there's just better value pockets than just taking the Sam Laporta. Yeah, I get that he should be the number one tight end, but like it almost kind of like sucks for him in that reason because like now he gets steamed up, he's super expensive, and you have to pay to get him when you could see a bunch of other guys like I'd rather take the field essentially versus Laporta at a much cheaper cost. Let's slide to the second half of round three. Uh, this is the section of all the old vets. It's Keenan Allen at 31, Travis Kelsey at 32, Jalen Waddell at 33, Lamar Jackson 34, then Mike Evans at 35, and Cooper Cup at 36. So four out of the six guys are definitely veterans who have been around the block a number of times. Fitz, what was your takeaway from this grouping of players? <sighs> Cooper Cup is too high and Jalen Waddell is too low. And... um. I don't know. I guess I'm just much higher on Jalen Waddle than anyone else. He's posted two straight thousand yard seasons, even though he's sharing a field with Tyreek Hill, um, had 1300 plus yards in 2022 last year, over a thousand yards, a uh, thousand fourteen yards in just 14 games. And that's with Tyreek Hill's health being pretty pristine the last couple of years. Like if if Hill 
was going to miss any time. Uh, Waddle obviously gets a big value boost, but like he produces with Tyreek Hill around and um, just, you know, a young player coming into his prime now, really high on Waddle and Cup's health is just such a major concern. And now Puka's there. So it just seems like there's there's not a hundred catch upside with Cooper Cup anymore, and and really he only had one one hundred catch season anyway. So um, for him to be a third rounder just seems really optimistic. Yeah, I mean Erickson, maybe I'm just being a victim of like shiny new object syndrome, but like if I'm looking in this round of players, I'm definitely gonna be taking Waddle over any of the older guys. It just feels like a, you have a better shot at really hitting it big than with these veterans who are on the back nines of their careers. Hundred percent. Like I lockstep with Fitz on the Waddle. Uh, I think that it's a contract year for him. Look, if there's any chance that Terry Kill doesn't average like over three yards per route run this year. Chances are that'll probably help Waddle. So you mentioned if Hill just takes like a fraction of a second, you know, or a fraction of his production comes down, like it's going to be Waddle in the offense that explodes. Like we saw everyone else in this offense explode last year except for Waddle. He was dealing with some injuries, but we know that it's very capable of, if you won your league last year, it's because you drafted Dolphins players, more likely than not. So how, how do you get the cheapest one this year? His name is Jalen Waddle because he's just discounted from last year when like he still was efficient. Like his yards per hour one was still really good. And, you know, what I found is he's always going to be at a good price because he's looked at as the number two receiver on his team. But would we really be crazily shocked if, oh, well, Waddle, you know, this is the year he finally outproduced Tyree Kill. It finally happened. Like, that's not crazy to think about. And if that happens, like, he's a guy that for me, that's why I have Waddle over Marvin Harrison Jr. I think Waddle has a better chance of getting in the top six in this Miami offense. And Marvin Harrison Jr. does in the Cardinals offense or whatever offense he he ends up going into because he's already been a wide receiver one in fantasy for two seasons. So uh, I also really like Waddle a lot. I know Erickson is, you know, his, his plan is to wait on quarterback and try and get the, you know, guy a couple rounds later. So Fitz, I want to ask you, you know, Jalen Hurts was at the top of round three, Lamar Jackson towards the back end of round three. Actually, if we had gone to 37 players, the next guy up is Patrick Mahomes. Obviously, we all agree on, or at least I think we all agree on, Josh Allen is QB1, but Hurts QB2, Lamar QB3, Mahomes QB4. Does that sound like the right order to you, even if you're not necessarily targeting those guys in these rounds? No, um, I, like I'm fading Hurts. Um, we saw just the drop-off in passing efficiency going from eight yards per attempt in 2022 to 7.2 last year. And I think from Thanksgiving on, it was like 6.5 yards per attempt. So he was not good as a passer last season, especially down the stretch. And I just don't know if we're going to get like, yes, he's been routinely scoring double digit touchdowns. What if that doesn't happen? And uh, the the 15 last year career high, I like, I don't want to count on the rushing touchdowns to float his value. I'm okay with Lamar in the back of the third round, and I'd even be okay with Mahomes in the back of the third round. Allen and and Hurts just seem like they are way too high right now as far as ADP. I think Mahomes, you know, they added Hollywood Brown. I, yep. you know, they might still add a guy who's going to be really talented at the end of the first round in this year's class. I, I think Mahomes could end up being a value. Is there anybody Erickson? that was not in the top 36 that you think should have been, that you really want to kind of plant your flag on. I mean, the next couple of guys in ADP, Tank Dell, DK Metcalf, James Cook, Rashad White, Isaiah Pacheco, Devonta Smith, Amari Cooper, Kenneth Walker, Mark Andrews, Drake London, CJ Stroud, T. Higgins, uh, or anybody lower. Is there anybody that you think really should have been in the top 36? Well, I just want to think it's worth noting that, you know, this is looking at like best ball ADP. So there is definitely a narrative for more wide receivers than running backs that you'll necessarily see. So, you kind of listed off that next tier of running backs, Rashad White, Isaiah Pacheco, uh, James Cook. Like, I am I have those guys in my, like, standard redraft top 36. Like, I think that the, those guys are worthy at the running back position where I would much rather take those guys than some of the older wide receivers that we kind of talked about just due to the scarcity of the position. I think that these running backs are young. Like, James Cook's a young running back. Rashad White, young running back. Like, Pacheco, young running back. Like, these guys are set up to, like, be really productive in their offenses. So I, I don't want to turn a, a shoulder on that type of production for a wide receiver that I'm really concerned about. Oh, like their production is going to dwindle. Are they going to be able to keep this up? So, yeah, I have those guys a little bit higher than the ADP ranks. I have them. 
Fitz, what do you think about guys that aren't in the top 36 that should be? I, I don't know that like like a Derrick Henry, for example, probably shouldn't be top 36, but I think he's definitely going to outperform. He's ADP 56 right now. You know, Zay Flowers thought another Raven year two. Trey McBride, I think, is a good one. Richardson at 50. Are there any names that stand out to you that really should be in the top 36? James Cook, for sure. Um, not only did he, like, man, he was terrific last year, but he only scored two rushing touchdowns on 237 carries. He scored a touchdown on under 1% of his carries. Um, Josh Allen scoring 15, uh, touchdowns on the ground. Like that's not going to happen again. So I think there's going to be some regression there that works out in James Cook's favor. Rashad White, I mean, it's very possible the Buccaneers draft a running back who poses some sort of threat to Rashad White's every down role, uh, in which case he would have to be dropped in my rankings at least. But we also thought the Bucs were going to add someone last year. They never really did. And White was just this really valuable workhorse. Kenneth Walker, I think people are totally sleeping on. I mean, when he came into the league, there were people who thought he was as good uh, or, or really close to Brees Hall in terms of talent. And like, I, I do think um, even if he's not as good as Brees Hall, he's still really talented and probably more talented than like half a dozen backs who are getting drafted earlier than he is. I don't know if it's Zach uh, Charbonnet scaring people away, but when they played, like Walker averaged basically twice as many touches per game as Charbonnet last year. Um, you know, well, Seattle was the fifth pass heaviest team in the league last year. Now they've got a new offensive coordinator. I do re realize it's the former Washington Huskies offensive coordinator, and they were pretty pass heavy last year, too. But I still think there's a chance they run it a, a little bit more this year. I mean, this guy's averaged just a hair under 80 scrimmage yards per game in his two years as a pro and has nine touchdowns in his first two years, despite missing two games in each of those two years. So I don't know. I just think people are sleeping on Kenneth Walker a little bit. We will get out of there on that one. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We ran through the top 36 players and even gave you a bunch of bonus ones as well. Appreciate appreciate everybody tuning in this week. As always, we'll be back again next week. For Erickson and Fitz, I am Ryan Warmly. We'll see you again next time.